everybody. Uh, we just recorded our uh, Bowen Hunters interview, and uh, I asked Steve to stick around a little bit longer to talk about The God Is Not Willing, which I think is now... So, hey, Steve, welcome back Hi. to the show. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. So I, th I, I think God, it, God Is Not Willing, if I'm right, is out right now in some countries, but not quite yet out in America, but probably in about by the time the show comes out, it'll be about most out most places, right? I think so. Um, I know it's it's available here in Canada, but um, Canada can get both the Random House editions plus Tor, the US yeah. editions. So obviously what they've done here is is the Random House editions have arrived. Of um, course. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I got my hands on it a few months ago, read it. I had a great time. I really like the book, great. Steve. Excited to talk to you about it today, you know. Um, cool. So I guess I first want to start with, so you finished The Crippled God. Com that comes out in 2011. Did you ever think you would follow up on those books? Or do you think then you thought that would be the end of it? No, I'd already signed for two trilogies. Really? Uh, one, yeah, one of them was the Carcanus, which I'm resuming, well, I have resumed um, writing the third one. Because the plan is to finish Walk and Shadow, then jump back to these three. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And yeah, uh, it's just the order turned out to be different. So, uh, yeah. so no, I always knew that uh, I was doing the, the Witness trilogy. And I hadn't quite decided at the time uh, when it was going to be taking place in the Malaysian world, but I basically decided on about 10 years after The mm. Crippled God. So that's kind of was my starting point. So I know because uh, if I'm not mistaken, you kind of make this you you start to understand about these follow ups, these two trilogies, not like maybe around Reaper's Gale told a hounds ish or something. I don't know where it falls in chronology, but uh, actually, when did I sign? I probably signed when I was writing the ninth book. OK, I think. Well, because the reason I asked was because, you know, at this at near the end of the book, some of the Tisty Andy and Carcana stuff, you know, kind of trickles into that series. Right. Yeah. And I wonder, did did any part of you know enough about where this story wanted to go that you were like, oh, should I be planting seeds to harvest later on so to speak um <clears throat> i think the seeds were planted in carsa orlong's relationship with the rest of the world um mm. and having the character of samar dev sort of uh, join join in allowed for an expansion of of some of the the prime issues that carsa was struggling with and dealing with with respect to civilization as somebody who is from the outside looking in and uh, his, I guess, somewhat more objective point of view, um, clashing with that of Samar Dev and her attitudes towards the civilization that she is in and one that she wants to propagate. So that thematically was sort of one of the things that I knew I'd be able to build off of. Um, mm. Because, I mean, Carson makes the vow, doesn't he, to, to bring civilization to an end. Yeah. And, and so once that was laid out there, um, I sort of had what I needed, um, at least as a starting point for what I would do with this with this trilogy. But then I started it, and I think I started it three times. Um, there's three different openings. And the first two led me to realize that I had to step further back. Yeah, from my memory, you wrote a large chunk of what you now think will be the second book, and then you yeah. knew you had to go back. Yeah. yeah, and I think I even have part of the third book. So I just realized that Carsa had a legacy, and that legacy had to be explored before we could even get to Carsa. You know, it's one thing to have a character wade through their story, if you will, um, in, in Rivers of Blood and all the rest. But then it's another to look back and see what are the consequences of what, what that character engaged in early on in the series. So that stuff I realized I had to get to. And uh, one of the huge aspects of that was going to be the consequences of uh, Carissa raping raping a woman in um, House House of Chains. Yeah, the fourth book at Silver Silver Lake. Yeah, I mean, I think... Uh... Well, I, I mean, I don't know. It, it's weird, but I think the book's really good. And I, you know, I mean, I know the show's somewhat laudatory, but it's like, yeah, I really enjoy the book. But I and I think one of the great things about it is the way that um, exactly what you're saying, that we're 
it is the book is an exploration of Carsa in some way, oh, yeah. but n- not but through the consequences of his actions and almost a dialogue about ourselves and how to talk about someone through the consequences of their actions, which I think yeah. is a very valid frame to discuss how to view someone, you know? Yeah. And, and you know, the reason why I, I sort of wrote a short essay saying, you know, saying basically that, that Carsa is not going to be in the first book was because there was so much high expectation was, was sort of coming my way that, you know, this was uh, the return of Carsa and he was going to be there on the first page and, and all the rest. And so once I realized that couldn't happen, then I felt, you know, basically obliged to, to let the, the, the fans know that um, they're going to have to wait a bit for Carsa. Yeah. But I also think it's one of those things that, um, I don't know, I don't know if like just like the car, the big Carsa swashbuckling adventure story for three books is what people really want. Do you know what I mean? Well, one hopes not. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it, it could be fun, but. Um, exactly. But yeah, is that like. That would be it. Yeah. Yeah. But so, so to, to, to follow up on some of this, you're talking about following up on his legacy, which obviously are the seeds that were planted in those. Mm-hmm. first 10 books but a lot of other seeds are followed up on mm-hmm. you know of course not only is this continuing the story of Carsa, but also in some way just following up on a lot of different plot threads in the series yeah. right um and i kind of love how the book really addresses this through a pretty indirect ways you know i i wouldn't say it's really explicitly trying to follow up on a lot of this stuff but it's in the background and you get a sense of how these things have progressed and advanced in the 10 years or so mm-hmm. since the crippled god and i wonder why you chose that approach and what what you were maybe afraid of in following up on things what you were excited to follow up on um no i wasn't afraid of following up um it's more picking and choosing um how much could i fit in sure you know that was intrinsically part of the story that i wanted to tell um because it would be too easy or the risk was kind of shoehorn stuff in um which i knew were consequences of everything that happened in the crippled god but what i what i did in sort of in order to counter that was that i uh, reduced the focus so the setting is is generally i think probably one of the smallest settings i, mean, I think I mean? so Geographically, Def- definitely yeah 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 so uh it keeps it all self-contained in that respect and so once once that was in place then only those consequences that actually had direct physical impact on the setting that I chose uh, would be the ones that played in. So, you know, if you think about it, at the end of the Amass war against the Jagud, the consequence of that is, you know, central to the novel. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, sorry, I got completely distracted trying to think about geography and all the books. No, right. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, yeah, so let's talk through a few of the characters. I mean, um, I think the conversation's still fairly fresh, but I definitely, I mean, Rant is, you know, I don't know, essentially the main character of the book. Mm-hmm. It, it doesn't need to be reduced that way, but like, it's, I don't know, kind of, right? Yeah, pretty much, yeah. Yeah, and I think talking about exploring the consequences of things, um, I mean, Rant is so burdened by the legacy of the, of these decisions, and um, I just found such a moving character Um Please tell me we're going to see him throughout all three books, and that he's like I don't know. That's my hope, at least. Mm. Yeah, I, I, um, his storyline has begun here, and I, I'm certainly um, recognizing that there is an obligation to follow that storyline through, and I, I, I don't think I would do otherwise. Um, it, it's too interesting. Um, oh, it's incredibly interesting because it's all leading up to that that final sort of face to face confrontation with his father, and so yeah, we have to get there, obviously. And then, you know, the other side of things, you've got the evolution of the Malaysia Marines um, sure. and what the Empire has done under the uh, surprisingly benign rule of Malik Rel. Mm. So, yeah. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll get to the Marines in a sec. I, I was curious when you come to this rant storyline, I mean... Yeah, I wonder if that was like a, a hook for you into this book or if you kind of discovered that type of thing along the way when you were trying to think about the consequences of these actions and how, I mean, examining the consequences of that rape and kind of the legacy of sexual sexual violence is a big part of the book, mm-hmm. I would say, in a way. Yeah. So I just wonder if that was like something you had from the offset or you kind of like you knew when you came into this novel, tackling Carson's legacy is kind of confronting that. I have to. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, you've been going through the the 10 very big books and and more than once uh, the conversation uh, has turned in that direction and has explored aspects of uh, sexual assault and violence. 
And because they are, they're part of the human condition. They're not a uh, particularly, they're not a part that one wants to jump into, um, you know, at the drop of a hat. So and everything needs to be considered very, very carefully, um, at least to my mind, before you want to venture into those, those subjects. And so I knew I had to go back there. There was, there was no other way around it. This was sort of the primary legacy of the blood oil and the, the devastation it left in its wake. And then it became an issue of, well, what are the, what does the legacy mean to those innocents who were caught up in it? And rant became, at, at that point, uh, the primary uh, focus for an innocent child produced um, from this, this act of violence. And once I started exploring that, I realized I'm going to have to explore the character of the mother as well. And mm. so, and that gave me the opportunity and the, it opened the door for me to explore the nature of the Malazan military as it has evolved. So I, I was able to bring both of those in, in terms of addressing and exploring that one aspect of Carson's legacy in, in Silver Lake, specifically the, the victims um, of his, his rampage through the town. Yeah, of course. I wonder, do you plan to talk more about blood oil and the... The, I don't know. I, I think it's 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 obviously an important part of that storyline in a way. I mean, and although it's, I think, focused more in this book, I, it still remains a somewhat mysterious thing, yeah. I feel, you know? Yeah, yeah. it will probably stay fairly mysterious. Um, I don't know if you've done any reading up or heard about uh, ayahuasca. Yeah, I know about it. Yeah. Well, you know, you've got biochemists are, are just, you know, picking that thing apart because it, it is... It is this combination of uh, various um, native plants uh, in a particular region. And if you get the proportions wrong, if you miss out on one of them, the entire concoction is lethal. And so it creates a, a kind of a, a chemical state that makes it um, not lethal, but its constituent elements are quite lethal. So it, it's, it's one of those things where as an anthropologist, you wonder, well, who the hell, you know, did the experimentation on this stuff and and worked sure. out what were the what were the um, the right proportions and measures and what to use what not to use how to cook it how to prepare it how to deliver it uh, it, it it's always kind of mind boggling that you know we've got people who are dealing with with highly toxic items um, in their environment and somehow they find a way to actually alter those environment that that toxicity to such a level to create hallucinogenic effects or whatever. And I, I kind of think of, of blood oil in the same way that it, it's that's why, you know, in terms of ingredients, it's almost more rumors than it is anything else. You know, mm. people talk about the oil extracted from, you know, one thing or another um, elements of otateral elements of, I think, seal oil or seal blubber, whale blubber. You know, there's, mm. there's all kinds of weird <laughs> stuff going on in this thing. And I, uh, I guess that's I'm sort of, yeah, it, it's it's a strange concoction. And um has uh, powerful psychotropic and, and physiological effects and it, in that sense it's no different from say ayahuasca or peyote or you know any of any of these these commonly known psychoactive chemicals concoctions that tribes and, and other peoples use so mm -hmm. yeah long answer for a, a fairly simple question sorry about that well the reason i asked was because obviously in this you know the blood oil uh, outside of like you know it's like plotty mechanic or whatever takes on a you know it gets explored in a more symbolic way in this book mm -hmm. especially talking about sarlis and carsa mm -hmm. and and kind of this relationship or metaphor through trauma or you know uh, you know have have what have you but also it gets relationship talking about to carsa and to rant and then uh, it's just it's an important part of it and i wonder if do you plan to explore that more as a symbol and is that something you were mindful about outside of its meaning as this kind of link through trauma or something i think if it's 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 going to be explored more it's it's more that specific linkage that you're talking about i think that's what i will return to in some fashion or another sure and because it, i find it i mean it is an interesting notion of shared trauma and and how individuals are quite unique in how they respond to that trauma in some fashion, you know, in whatever fashion they, that, that they happen to. And whether that's a conscious response or an involuntary response, I think mm. is, is, you know, those, those aspects, if you want, you know, in some ways it's all about triggering, isn't it? Mm. Um, everything about that I'm exploring in that idea is about the notion of triggering in, in, in the psychological sense. Yeah, um, yeah. 
And it seems to be a very fairly relevant topic uh, these days. And so, you know, rather than pretend that doesn't exist, that, you know, that there are, there are trigger warnings in, in, you know, on television and film and in books that now precede books, um, or I don't, I don't know if they haven't, haven't done that yet on the page, like in, in television and film, but mm. it's almost as if an audience is potentially unprepared for the possibility of being triggered within a work of fiction when works of fiction from day one have always almost had that possibility built in because in any narrative, any story that explores to any extent the human condition uh, has the potential of triggering somebody. And so, you know, it, it sits behind uh, every novel that's ever published, uh, every short story, even poems for that matter. Uh, it sits behind every image that's that's shown online or or anywhere else. So that potential is always there. So with blood oil, um, it became a, a useful metaphor for exploring the, the consequences of traumatic events and the psychological state, not only of the victims, but of those whose very existence was dependent upon that traumatic event. So the, the, the child of a rape, for example. Sure. And it, it struck me that that this is a thing, you know, it's, it's worth exploring. It's actually worth delving into. And as you're, as you're aware, because you've read the book, you know, the opening scene with Carsa is when he flashes back to it, it's, it's pretty um, in itself uh, trauma-inducing. Yeah. So um, it, it, it starts that way. And that's my way of kind of signposting that this is, this is going to be the subject at hand. This is what we're going to not shy yeah. away from. Yeah. Um, you're talking about the scene with Rant, right? Yeah. 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 So, no, I mean, definitely, you know, I'm not going to lie. I open up the book, you know, I get this copy and I'm like, oh, cool. Time for a new, like, this will be exciting, you know? And like, you know, it's like, then it hits you, it comes right out of the gate. And of course, part of me is like, oh, oh my God. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's like, you know, I don't know. I've certainly critiqued it on the show and I'm like, oh, we're doing this again. It's like, oh my gosh. But then I was, you know, I don't want to say I was stoked or anything, but it's like, I was at least relieved that I felt felt that it was like a central part of the text of this yeah. book. Do yeah. you know what I mean? That- yeah, and, and Damask, everything everything comes down to the response of Damask because yeah. that is what gives you the context. Uh, Damask is great in this book. As the reader, that gives you the context of how is this going to be explored? How is this going to be discussed? So without Damask, uh, that scene, the original Rand scene would never have shown up because uh, it's, it's like you say, it's, it's, um, it's visually disturbing. You know, yeah. and it's, no, it's, it's hard to read. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And Damask as the old worn out, you know, ex trapper, um, who's really not prepared to deal with this stuff, then becomes almost representative of all of us. Uh, if we were to stand in his shoes and then, to, you know, to be asked to deal with, you know, something like that, that has happened to somebody that, that you're now sitting across from, you know, where do you go? What do you do? Right. Where do you, where do you take it from there? Um, yeah. How do you, how do you navigate your way through what apparently is such a level of uh, not just innocence but ignorance in, in rent that he's un, he's incomprehensive, if you will, of what exactly has happened to him, and and that's that's sort of the challenging aspect of things. Yeah, I think when you have that. Mm, a childlike element to rant. I don't know how to describe it. And I feel like Damas to me almost evokes like uh, Western stereotypes. Do you know what I mean mm-hmm. like so that type of thing? So the contrast of that age difference in that relationship in the first ha- part of the book or so, I feel like is like really felt. And I don't know. I think you Damas has that presence for a reason. Mm-hmm. And obviously evoking that type of father figure role is a whole separate thing together. You know. Well, and he's also kind of a stand-in for. How does society, how does uh, elements within that society, uh, groups, units, individuals, um, how does it navigate its relationship with someone who has been horrifically victimized? Sure. Um, and that ties into the theme that they then can fold into the Malazan Marines and the sense of social responsibility, which I wanted to explore very much so and was foremost in my mind um, with how the Marines were going to respond to the, the climactic disaster that sort of befalls uh, the entire region. 
Yeah. So they're all they're all bound together, basically. Yeah, they are all right. I mean, yeah. The, I guess the reason I, I kind of was curious so much about Blood Oil is because I think when I critique these books about how the violence against women are in the books or these thoughts, or when I was critiquing the scenes about Carsa, something that stands out to me that I'm really curious about is what the meaning of this violence is within Tablor society, what it means to Carsa, what masculinity means, what it means violence against women means in the society, and how blood oil intersects with that is a separate conversation and seems to be how an important part of how the Tablor would talk about it, the details of it would matter to me. And I felt like I walked away from this book not learning as much about that type of stuff as I expected to or wanted to, because I felt like that was going to give a lot. I, I wanted that to give context to how I thought about th that sexual violence, because that context seemed vital to me. And I wonder mm. if going forward, you think you, you're, you would be interested in writing more about that or we w could expect to learn more about these things, about the context around this violence, about the context around gender in that society? Um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I suspect so. Um, you know, I, at the end of the of this book, there there is a remnant element of the the Tevlor population is, is surviving. Yeah. And so so they have physically survived but culturally, they have been annihilated, and so there will be the issue of well, what what do these people fashion for themselves to take its place, and what are the influences what, you know that are going to pertain to that, that remaking, that, that revisualizing of, of cultural identity or personal identity, and of course, the big influence that's going to be that's fairly obvious is that of the people who saved their lives, and that's the Malaysian Marines. Mm. So, uh, if you recall. Towards the end, there's, there's that's touched on rather directly when a number of the Teblor seek to become Marines, yeah. um, just having witnessed what they witnessed. So, which sounds like it's kind of a recipe for fun. But I know oh, they, yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm yeah. sure there's more serious parts to it. But it's like, of course, there are there are. It, it's now you know they basically not only had their their homeland stripped away, but their their cultural identity has been stripped away. So all the mechanisms that were operating in isolation up in the mountains, well, they're not going to work here, you know, anymore. Sure. Where they're coming, where they're going to end up, and so they will have to face um, that self-examination of uh, those behaviors um, and those those structures that that society imposed upon itself, and and it's going to you know be shown in a fairly harsh harsh light. I don't think there's any way around it. I mean, there is historical precedence for this. Uh, the use of hashish, for example, um, mm. you know, not just the assassins, but the imbibing of those particular drugs um, by by warriors and soldiers uh, prior to battle, for example. So there's a lot of, uh, his, there is historical precedence for something like blood oil. But at the same time, blood oil is simply, um, it's, it's something from their environment that they've stumbled upon and... Um, they've incorporated within their concept of their own culture and their own identity. Mm. And of course, one of the, the worst consequences of all that is when that culture that makes use of blood oil then encounters another culture that physiologically can't handle the blood oil, mm. um, then you, you run into other issues. And I don't know if it's analogous to, to bringing um, alcohol to North American native groups. I'm not sure if it is because I think I'm thinking now that the Aztecs uh, must have had a corn-based, yeah, probably corn-based alcohol, yeah. But if if one were to, th to think in terms of something that is brought to, well, I mean, the classic example would be smallpox. Mm. Um, yeah, you know, it wasn't um, not initially, anyways, deliberately brought into the new world um, as a means of uh, cultural genocide or destruction. But uh, there were there are instances where it you know, deliberately impregnated blankets were traded to, to native groups yeah. for the hopes of wiping them out. So a culture with, you know, in possession of something um, can weaponize it uh, in, in any fashion it so chooses, which is not to say that the entire culture um, is is okay with that because it, it's the acts of individuals within a culture that, that can do things like that. So the relationship of, of blood oil may actually become a moot point because I don't think the supply still exists. And so it may it may no longer be uh, relevant at all. Yeah. yeah. But do you think there'd be more conversation around the meaning around sexual violence and how gender is constructed in those societies? Um, 
It would be probably part of the, the entire parcel of, of self-examination. Yeah, I figured. Um, yeah, I, I don't think it's it's not something any, anybody in that culture is going to be highlighting yeah. because you know it's it's integral to their worldview. Even that which we describe as violence or or w- which we culturally would would give the name rape to is not quite what the tableau think of it when mm. when Karsa for example takes over takes the village in the fourth novel um so uh, it's it, it's almost uh, I don't want to reduce it to semantics but it it's it relates to a particular culture's understanding of certain aspects of the counting coup elements to its endemic warfare mm. which that culture is based around and I don't know if you've done any anthropology readings say on like the the Dani or like that, uh, some of the tribes of, of um, Indonesian islands and all that. But when you've got sort of warrior based or conflict based cultures, the conflict is central to almost the entire structure of that culture and everything is bound to it. And so you almost can't take any, you can't pluck anything out and make it distinct and say, well, this is a bad thing or this is a good thing. Everything is, is, is leaning against everything else. So I suspect that will come up. But it won't be a direct conversation. It will be indirect yeah, if, it, if it occurs. So Well, I want to move on to some other stuff, but I did want to quick just ma- make a note. I've been doing, we kind of touched on it. I've been doing other history re- reading recently. And the, um, mm-hmm. the amount of, you just look at the span of human history, the amount of human history, which people were just like drunk all the time or just high, <laughs> just like high or so. It's just like, really, we are living in this strange outlier period we where are. people are way sober all the time, you know, yeah. depending on where you are, of course. But oh, it is- no, it, it, absolutely. Absolutely. And it seems to have been one of the, the first things we did as species was was find me- means by which we could alter our conscious uh, perceptions so fast. Yeah, it's like ha- it's something elemental. Just people are people are getting altered consciousness since forever, yeah. all the time. They love doing it, you know, and you didn't even need drugs. You didn't need psychoactive stuff. You all, all you have to do is dance long enough. Yeah. Listen to the drums long enough and. Yeah you'll get there. <laughs> you, yeah, yeah. you don't need the other stuff. I mean, the shamans, you know, that, that sort of whole side of things that, that, that starts bringing in some of the really interesting um, psychoactive chemicals. Yeah. But generally, uh, it was a cultural tradition, probably from very early on, to have everybody collectively get completely wrecked yeah. in some fashion or another. Yeah. And like on a on a side note, it's like, I you know, I've moved to Japan now. Right. And like Japan has a totally different drinking culture than America. And it's mm-hmm. like something I totally was unaware of that it'd be like transitioning into a different way to interact with substances like that. You know, yeah. especially if you have a ritual based culture, uh, then it will incorporate all aspects of uh, of its material society or, or its pro- produce into into the ritualization of some fashion or another. Yeah, and I mean you've got that in your tea ceremonies um, yeah. where you are. So, but anyway, back, let's 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 stick to this book. So we mentioned it earlier. I wanted to touch on it. So a whole new cast of Malazan Marines enter the mm. book, right? And um, a great cast, a lot of really memorable ones. It's great to have Spindle back, you know. But it's still, I would say, a fairly smaller cast, especially Mm -hmm. compared to at the end of Crippled God. I mean, the amount of named Malazan soldiers is like, you know, I don't know. I I, you can't even count. Um, But like, I think they're all really fun. You know, Stillwater, Sano. You have a lot of great ones. Um, I wonder how you went about crafting that, and if you were like when you knew you were going to follow up on it, did you know you had to have Malazan Marines in it? Do you think it's something fans expect? Uh, I don't know if they expected it or not, but I was definitely going to do it because I mean, there are multiple legacies here, right? It's not just uh, Carson's legacy. Mm. Um, it's the Malazan occupation of that region. It's the Malazan empire um, bringing slavery to an end. These are, you know, those are huge legacies. And so you had, the community of Silver Lake and being completely impoverished by the prohibition against slavery that the Malaysian Empire had imposed upon upon the place, and so uh, the Marines had to walk that ground again. And Spindle was the only character I could actually dig up that actually would, could potentially fit in to, to the storyline as, sure. as I ripped it out. But I just had a blast with the characters, and and you know when Stillwater came onto the page, um, I wasn't sure where where or what. Uh, I knew she was going to be 
a character I would revisit, but I didn't realize that she was going to be quite as entertaining to write as she turned out to be. Well, I feel like she kind of s- steals the book in a way. She you does. Know, yeah. I, 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 I don't know. I mean, yeah. Rant, Rant is like such a, kind of a more emotional heart, but it's like, I don't know. She every she steals the scene, a uh, book, whatever. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And it's funny because I don't mean this in a derogatory sense, but she's on the spectrum. And that's mm-hmm. how I wanted to write her. And I wanted to write, you know, I've written so many battle scenes, so many fight scenes, you know, how many variations can you actually do on that kind of stuff? Sure. And still already gave me one. And what it was, was she was going to have a running commentary through all of her fight scenes. Mm. I mean, she's literally talking to her, you know, to her enemies um, yeah, yeah. all the way through her fight sequences. And that was great fun to write as well. Mm. Yeah, I think she's just, she's a great through line and she's probably the marine i enjoyed the most i think yeah so you talk about uh to to touch back on spindle who i would say kind of links in a one of these like direct links from the past to this book you have a few other characters of course you know you have like these cameos so to speak of characters who directly showed up again and i wonder how you decided or who you were excited to have kind of come back or who you kind of knew you wanted to leave be? Um, I wanted to go as minimal as possible in terms sure. of cameos. You can almost, you could end up, you know, with an avalanche of, of you know, cameos. Well, exactly. You, you have so many to pick from. So many you know? to choose from. Yeah. So it, it made more sense to me to go as minimal as possible. Mm. Um, so even the, uh, the Anamena Rake one is, it's open to debate whether that actually was Anamata Rake or... Uh, it, I know it's kind of walking that line. Yeah, and quite deliberately so. Um, yeah. Munkrat, I need for the second and third books. So I needed to... I brought him in uh, for that for that purpose. Hmm. And I'm not sure who else is in there. But I, I, it was just good fun to... Even though they're not cameos because they're new characters, but in a sense, the Malaysia Marines sort of stand in for the familiarity that I think readers are going to be looking for. Sure. Yeah, I, I, I agree. And, and, you know, the, the sort of the new take on the heavies and characters like uh, Ohms, um, just, yeah, it was just, um, they would feel familiar and yet hopefully still be, you know, unique and, and fresh. Yeah. So I, 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 I found them fresh, but I, I understand that anxiety, especially considering how I mean, how many times have you written about a squad of Marines and yeah. each one of them's got their own thing. And yeah, you know, um, also shout out to Gruff, have to shout out. You know, but, um, <laughs> oh, um, he was good fun. He was really yeah. good fun. I wanted a real, real badass captain, but not yeah. in the usual fashion. No, it, I, 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 I like that character a lot for multiple reasons, but, um, you know, I know, uh, you were writing about, I forget where, I was reading some interview or something, I don't know. And you were talking about how, of course, there are a lot of soldiers throughout your book. You write, you've write, you written a lot about soldiers. And I know that going into this book, you wanted to examine soldiers more or think about them and maybe what they mean on some sort of elemental level, you know? Um, uh, I don't know about elemental, but quite often in fantasy... And maybe even in the real world, uh, there is this view of soldiers as almost exclusively created as weapons of violence. And of course, historically, uh, before private armies or before uh, rather professional armies, um, your average soldier was not really a soldier at all. It was just a person drawn out from the fields and and, uh, made to fight on behalf of a kingdom or whatever city state. Sure. Um, so it was part of their toolkit to be soldiers, but it, it, they weren't as such professional soldiers, but the Malaysian empire has professional soldiers. And so um, I was thinking in terms of, well, what other roles, what does the soldier represent for the nation that has created, uh, that, that individual. And sometimes I think we forget, you know, you can think of the soldier as, uh, the physical manifestation of the will of a state and its participation vis-a-vis other states. So in other words, war. 
right? Sure. But as a professional army, it does not spend the majority of its time in war. It spends its time doing other things. Yeah, which I think you're touching on this very yeah. real juxtaposition between both soldiers, like explicitly, like their job is to do acts of violence. This is kind of what they're trained and the point is, but yeah. they spend a lot of time doing nothing and many of them don't do any violence and just yeah. do other tasks yeah. for their yeah. entire time, you know? Yeah, and, and so then the question is, well, what function do they serve potentially within a society if you have a professional army? I mean, classic examples would be the, the U.S. Corps of Engineers. Uh, they sure. build highways. You know, they build dams. They, they do all the engineering work. Um, and I touched on that early on. Like, it's one of the opening aspects of our visit with the Marines is the roads that they built and spindle remembering building those roads sure and so that's kind of at that point i was hoping to signal the reader that this is this is going to explore what it is to be a soldier that does not focus exclusively on the violence that is implicit in being a soldier yeah so the, the soldiers even talk about it at some point yeah, i think when they they're do. helping sarlis or something yeah. I, 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 yeah, yeah i forget the exact scene they do they talk about responsibility yeah, um exactly and of course at the end yeah and so that's what I really wanted to explore in this in this book was the notion that a nation creates an army not exclusively for waging a combat, but as a potential representative of the the ethics implicit in that country. And that's what I was really wanted to play around with. Yeah. Well, I think you touch on Spindle and I think when you you know it's an interesting point in this way in that, you know, when I think you're dealing with an empire this large and a nation that has expanded this much and expansion's a part of how it's developed itself, you know, you inevitably have soldiers that are not combat is not like the only thing they've done. And the, the role of soldier actually becomes a much more expansive one where you have these engineers and you have all these different things. So you have a character like Spindle who not only has killed people in combat, has gone to war for the empire, but also has built roads. And now as an older man finds himself doing, you know, essentially mundane, you know, the kind of like, I don't know, it's not, it's not warfare, so to speak. Yeah. Yeah. You know. And then, of course, the other you know the other way of viewing an army, uh, a professional army, is in times of disaster. Mm. That's your first call. Sure. And, and these people are there are there to provide a service uh, for its citizens. And you know, morally, ethically, that's that's kind of the highest standard one could ever reach for. And I think sometimes that's forgotten in our world that, that this is. This is a service. It's a service to, to the citizens of, uh, of a nation to put on that uniform. And I, I, I wanted to sort of acknowledge that in a non-combat context. Sure. <sighs> yeah. <laughs> no, it's just interesting, you know. So um, I guess my, I, one, one thought is, you know, I've always been curious how, you know, the book the books are always, you know, structures and how we create them and how they reinforce power or don't, re you know, oppress and liberate mm -hmm. you know are a part of the series in before and somewhat in this book but i uh i don't know it's a smaller scale less less big structural things in this book yeah. but i do uh i'm curious if, if you think you would like to interrogate more how like the systems around soldiers both create soldiers and use them be it the state or be it like the army proper because mm -hmm. i i don't know if necessarily I, I don't feel like the army as a concept is like put on the table that much in the series no, no, it's not. And so, but at the same time, there is a meta narrative that goes straight to this subject in the 10 book series. Mm. And you, you've just gotten to the end of the Bone Hunters. This is the moment at which this army, this, this professional army, has cut its ties with the empire that created it. Yeah. And it's going off to do something not for the empire, but on behalf of everyone. So in that sense, I'm revisiting that kind of theme, but on a much, much more condensed, focused scale. Yeah. Well, then there's a way and it's like, well, I guess they are an army, but what does that word mean here? You know, so. Yeah. Anyway, to bring it back to this book here. So we just had this conversation about the Bone Hunters and in it, I don't know, we were discussing the climate and climate disaster and 
we were talking about how that is made most explicit in this book in a mm -hmm. way that I don't think the reader really can miss. I mean, no, well, hopes not. Yeah, I mean, I mean, essentially, like I don't know, some things go over readers' heads, of course. Yeah. You know, it different for different levels of things, but but of course, these people imperiled by climate and then they become climate refugees. You know, is like essentially the problem of the book in a way. Mm -hmm. in, yeah, in, in and, a large scale. Absolutely, and and then the question is. What does a society, what is the nature of a society's response to an influx of refugees? Well, because that's what I was going to get to, because it's yeah. something I was on my mind. Because, of course, in book nine of uh, In Dust of Dreams, near the end of that series, all of a sudden you talk about refugees in a major way. Right. And um, I wondered if you knew this was like not if you knew. Climate refugees are such an emerging issue as there's going to be so many displ people displaced by climate. And I, I wonder if you, if this question of how do we deal with these people and how do we meet them? Like, why did you choose that this this issue is something that needed to be reflected in your new novel? Well, I, I think you're right. I think it was reflected. I was touching on it towards the end of the of the, uh, the main series. And so but I only touched on it barely. And yeah, yet, it was a lot, a lot going on. A lot. Yeah, going on. and as as time has gone on, you know, just ten plus years, that issue has has definitely, as predicted, uh, gotten a lot more um, immediate in consequence. Yeah, of course. So it's it's a subject matter that I think fantasy is well placed to explore uh, in a non threatening fashion. Yeah, because it can be hard for some people to think. Clearly, if they see their entire neighborhood change in the, you know, in the course of, of six months. And it's, it's a volatile subject. And fantasy is one of these genres where um, we are kind of freed of constraint in terms of approaching volatile subjects, uh, perhaps more than uh, mimetic novels, um, contemporary fiction. Mm. Because so once, you've done, once you're doing in contemporary fiction, you're loading it with cultural uh, contextuality that people may have other opinions on but in a fantasy setting you know what opinions there are no opinions um sure so uh it it, it to me it, it's it's a fantastic genre for going going to these issues and then asking the big questions of well you know what is the right thing to do what is the honorable thing to do what what acts are the ones that show us in our best light versus in our worst so I don't think I'll ever, you know, shy away from from this kind of subject matter in my fantasy stuff. The, the the genre just invites invites that exploration, at least to my mind. Yeah. So this actually, let me take. Well, let me derail it into a personal question. I feel. Sure. And let me start with myself. You know, I feel like a lot of I don't know. Let me cast myself as the every person. You know, I feel like when I was a kid and the reason I get into these stories, right, is because like orcs are cool. It's cool when there's a dragon and swords are fun and then there's going to be an adventure and, you know, there's just you get, you get swept up into it. And then mm -hmm. there's like the world and you find all this really interesting. But I, you know, I don't, I don't think it was for a long time, you know, probably not until relatively recently, I feel that I really started, I would say, to take this type of genre fiction and genre fiction writ large very seriously. Right. Because, of course, in the larger community in in some nebulous critical space, you know, it's like genre fiction is not literature or something, mm -hmm. you know, and that mm -hmm. like, oh, this maybe this horror story is lesser because it has these genre elements. Right. This is a broad caricature, you know. Mm -hmm. But I wonder at what point in your life did you really start to take genre fiction and fantasy really seriously in this way? Like from the beginning, did you view these stories as a way to engage with these big ideas or did that come later? I don't know. I wonder how wrapped up these things are for you. Really early on. I mean, uh, I, I primarily read science fiction. And so, you know, you read, say, Ursula Le Guin's The Dispossessed, and you see the big subjects are being are being explored here. Yeah, I feel like it, that, I feel like science fiction is the genre fiction that is almost most direct about it in a way. Yeah. Yeah. And um, so in that respect, I, I, it never struck me as in any way unusual to be equally as direct uh, in a fantasy setting. Uh, yeah. And of course, what then it begs the question of well, what is magic standing in for? And then once you've answered that, well, what are the implications of magic? And 
then once you've answered that, then all the stories sort of present themselves to you. And Cam and I explored this in our own gaming. So, you know, if you think, uh, you, you do role-playing games, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I don't know if we were weird. Well, I know we were weird, but I mean, I don't know how weird we were. Um, because the games that we, that we ran, the campaigns that we ran, went straight to the heart of those fundamental questions. So mm-hmm. even, even something as, as you know, um, fun and, and social and, you know, roll of the dice, uh, exciting scenes described, you know, crazy magic, um, lots sure. of fun, people laughing, you know, something, something as innocuous as, as a role-playing game became for Cam and I this, this amazing vehicle with which we could actually go straight to the big questions using the Malazan setting to actually turn metaphors, make them real, and then just go for it. And so it, it was in place even before we started writing the books. I think Cam and I had already, we'd already been there. We'd already got there. Yeah. 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 I love that for you. I mean, I don't know. I, I got to be honest. I feel like, I don't know. I, I of course love genre fiction, but I think some part of me obviously cannot excise this, like whatever, judgy thing from it do you know what i mean it's hard it's hard because it is integral to study of literature Um, exactly once you and put once you enter the study it's like yeah and it's it's a lot of academia carving out its own territory um and not stepping outside of what is perceived as populist and and not belonging in an institution of any you know of any form um it's that it's that swirly mix out there that that's the crass tastes of of the the common people etc etc so i mean that's all there right you know um, of course yeah and so that's that's what the genre fights against and has been fighting against for a long time yeah i mean i think i'm not trying to broadly characterize critics i mean god knows people love ragging on them but i mean i do think some like lots of There is a good conversation around genre, of course, and I think it is not utterly dismissed. But I would say I do think it's broadly considered lesser in some sense, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. um, Yeah, I always had sort of this this lovely notion that it would be really nice to one day be have one of my books reviewed in in Harper's magazine, you know, because I used to read Harper's all the time. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Or the Atlantic, or you know, um, these like. The serious magazines. The serious magazines, yeah. And it's just, you know, magic realism? Absolutely. But exactly. uh, yeah. <laughs> if maybe yeah. it was like a foggy city and then what's that? It could change Shamal was in the alley. Yeah. I think you could get it done. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've long since given up. I've long since given up. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's just something on my mind. It mm-hmm. often is. But um, to, to touch back on the question I was going to ask at the beginning, but then oh, yeah, I forgot it. It was about the scope. You know, you met, we were talking, I was thinking, because the reason is, I was thinking through every book in the series, and I was like, yeah, is there a book with a, equally a small scope? I was like, yeah, maybe Gardens of the Moon, maybe Toll the Hounds, but still even then, those books are bigger in a lot of ways, not only with their cast, but also somewhat with their geography. Yeah. So I think, I think about this book, and not only huge cut down, I mean, it's like maybe 500-ish pages, I read it on the Kindle, but it's, it's a shorter read for sure. Oh, yeah. And then also, I don't know, there's like four storylines or something. There's Mm -hmm. essentially one very large geographic setting. I I wonder why you chose to cut down on the scope this much, especially was it just inevitable coming off of the crippled God? But my understanding is Carcanus is also a fairly. Yeah, it's big. big Yeah. Um, I don't know. Uh, I settled on a particular style and I think the decision came early to be very direct. Yeah, because it's a it's a fast book. I feel. Yeah, it's a fast book. Yeah, so keep it really, really tight uh, stylistically um, and tonally. You know, one of the impacts uh, of writing and knowing you're writing a ten book series um, is it's not a question of oh I can just ramble. No, it's more a question of well how many themes can I actually delve into in a ten book series of three million words? It turns out a lot. Right. A fair, you, you, you try to squeeze a lot in. I pretty much tried to squeeze everything I could in. And the nice thing with that was I always knew that, you know, by the time I was, maybe by the 10th book, but maybe not by the 10th book, but up until that point, there was always room and space to return to it in some fashion or another, if not specifically with the characters and their storylines, but thematically. Yeah. So it's it was basically with that series, there are elements that I'm sure you're aware of in, in crippled god which actually 
refer all the way back to Gardens of the Moon. Wild stuff, and then, yeah. And then, yeah, I mean, structurally, there are elements and thematically that refer back to Dead House Gates and Memories of Ice, and, and yeah. it's it's doing that all the way through the, the entire book, um, maybe also including Dust of Dreams. So there is a kind of a, a freedom to that. And so this time I'm sitting here looking at a trilogy, and that's a much tighter project. Um, yeah. And because of that, um, I've already laid out, I think, enough themes, even in the first book, that... I can come back and revisit uh, in the next two. So, uh, you know, it, it, in a sense, the groundwork's already been laid. And and then there's the, the, the sense also that I am also privileged in that the groundwork was laid by 10 books previous to this, hmm. which is not the same in Carcanus because Carcanus is a prequel to all of this stuff. So it needs to do a lot more world building. This book, I didn't do, basically didn't have to world build, if you think about it. It's no, all there. Yeah, I, now, I, I, not that I think anyone would just pick this book up, but I think essentially there's no way you could. I mean, I, I don't know. I, I don't know. That's uh, yeah, a good I, I don't know. It's hard. I don't think. But the thing is, the world, the setting is pretty small, so I don't think it would be like impenetrable or anything. But it, no. I do feel that it is. There's very little exposition about the setting. There's very little exposition in the book in general. Yeah. yeah essentially, essentially, the most exposition is just like, oh, yeah, here's some stuff about the Tablor and their current situation, like maybe immediate details, you know? But outside of that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, listen, I, I think I think everyone's going to be stoked to read the next one, Steve. Um, I know Walk and Shout is going to come out next. Uh, you, do you think that's, I'm going to guess that's not next year? No. What do you think? Yeah. Um, knowing how long it takes the publishers and, and how long it's taking me in, in COVID, uh, it's, it, it's going to be probably another seven, eight months of writing. Sure. So, yeah. Well, listen. Uh, I think everyone is stoked to have a new book out and I appreciate you taking some extra time to sit down and talk about it with me. It was fun. This is the first first conversation I've had, actually, uh, in any, oh. any interview uh, with The God Is Not Willing. I, awesome. think, I think most most uh, people are waiting for the U.S. release. and then Yeah, will- I, it's tough because I just put out a conversation about it, but I know that a lot of our American listeners haven't. You yeah, know, but yeah, yeah. It'll, it'll be out soon enough and then everyone can dive in, you know. Yeah, yeah. I hope so. All right. Well, thanks again, Steve. And I look forward to talking to you soon. Alrighty. Take care.